Our next speaker is Professor Linda Wang. She is the Maxine Spencer Nichols Professor in the Davidson School of Chemical Engineering at Purdue University. Her research interests are in the chemical and biochemical separations, as well as multi-component chromatography. Her talk today is titled Converting Polyolefin Waste into Fuels. Dr. Wang, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Ginger. I'd like to thank the Barbara and uh, all the symposium organizers uh, for inviting me uh, to this symposium. I really had a wonderful time, heard many wonderful talks and interesting discussions. Thank you very much for giving me this uh, opportunity to share what uh, the, the major problem that I've been concerned with for the last uh, decade, actually. So uh, I'm going to share with you why I am so concerned about this plastic pollution problem. And I'll show a short video uh, to show you some images. And I would like you to consider three key questions. The first one is, will the planet be inhabitable in 2050? The second question is, can we afford to clean up the oceans and landfills in the future? Third one is, can we save the planet in time? And I don't have answers to these questions. I would like to hear, to hear your thoughts uh, and ideas. And I think I'm going to introduce to you about the Purdue Plastic Waste Upcycling uh, Methods uh, in development. And I hope this may help uh, this uh, problem. And basically two uh, techniques. One is called selective sequential extraction and absorption. The second one is hydrothermal processing for converting uh, waste plastics into useful products. So the remaining of the talk will focus on the how to convert polyolefin waste to gasoline or diesel fuels. Over the past few decades, we have developed a dependency on single-use plastic products in our daily lives. The problem is that only 14% of the plastic waste is being collected and only 9% is recycled and reused. As a result, we are seeing a rapid accumulation of the plastics in the environment, where it degrades slowly into microplastics and releases toxic chemicals. This pollution creates a serious risk to all living creatures in our water and food supplies. By 2050, the planet will have 30 billion tons of plastic waste in landfills. Even worse, the oceans will have more plastics than fish. Once the waste gets into the oceans, it's irreversible because the cost of cleaning the oceans is enormous. To prevent more plastic waste from going into the environment, our team is developing new technologies that can convert over 80% of this waste into profitable products. For example, we can convert grocery bags and packing materials into clean fuels, wax, or pristine polymers. We can also convert polystyrene cups or food containers into pristine polystyrene, which can be remade into new products. Our goal is to develop multiple ways for industry to make a profit in processing plastic waste. This will create a driving force for the public to participate in recycling and ultimately reduce the amount of plastic waste and associated risk to the environment. So the first question I'd like you to consider is the will the planet be inhabitable in 2050? You might have heard about Stephen Hawking's statement in 2017. Humanity has only 100 years left to leave Earth or perish. And his, his conclusion was based on the following uh, factors, global warming, overpopulation, pandemics, nuclear war. Unfortunately, on his list is not, they did not consider the plastic uh, pollution problem. So my question is, do we still have 100 years left? So this graph shows the exponential growth 
of the plastic waste accumulation over the last 100 years. And the notice that between 2005 and 2020, in the last 15 years, the total amount of waste accumulated on this planet exceeds the, all the total amount produced over the last 75 years. So uh, this accumulation can be seen in this uh, pictures of the Henderson Island in 1992. It was pristine then, but in 20 some years later, can you see the, the beach was full of plastic waste. So this really concerns us is what would our beach looks like, you know, in 2050. So the, some of you might have known that in the deepest dive into the ocean last year in Mariana Trench, 36,000 feet deep, they found very few living organisms, but they found a plastic bag. That th I thought that was pretty sad. And actually you can find plastic waste and microplastics everywhere from the Alps to the Arctic Ocean. They're degrading slowly over decades or even centuries. So this was the plastic bag in the Ar uh, Arctic Ocean floor, 8,000 uh, some 8,000 feet deep. And uh, these are the microplastics in the snow from the Alps to the ice in the Arctic. So actually you can find microplastics everywhere. They're in the beach sands, sea salts, uh, fish in California, and most of the seabirds in Europe. And uh, this plastic pollution is killing a million seabirds and 100,000 marine mammals per year. And pretty soon you, should, you will find the microplastic on the, your consumer plates. So the second question I'd like to, you to consider is, can we afford to clean up the oceans and the landfills in the future? So in my estimate, it takes about a dollar a kilogram to retrieve plastic waste from landfills without any processing into useful products. And this cost is higher than the, right now, the virgin plastics are produced at, uh, from the crude oil. So there's no way that uh, any business will make a living out of this uh, activity. And it takes about 0.3 cents to clean up one gallon of dirty water. However, the ocean has 3.5 times 10 to the 20th gallons of ocean water. So if you multiply these two numbers together, you get 10 to the 18th dollars. And this is 10,000 times of global GDP. So the question is really, uh, does that mean that we cannot afford to clean up the oceans? in the future? And does this mean irreversible damage to our ecosystems? And the, does it mean that it's inevitable this will impact on the water, food supplies, and human health? So there are potential methods for reducing the plastic waste accumulation. Uh, the first one is incineration. This is about 12% of the waste is being uh, reduced by incineration. However, this method can cause air pollution in other words, you're converting uh, the landfills in the, in the, on the earth and through landfills in the sky. You have a low energy return and the tipping fees are usually needed for anybody to do this. The second method is mechanical recycling. Right now, less than 9% of the plastic products are, uh, at the end of life uh, are recycled. And this is the most limited the sorted plastic waste. And yesterday we heard a wonderful talk on the gasification and bioconversion to convert uh, this mixed plastic waste uh, into ethanol and some other chemicals. And I look forward to the talk, our keynote speech uh, on the pyrolysis. And there are many research groups are actively uh, trying to find ways of converting the plastic waste into other useful products. And these are still in the research stage. And biodegradation is also uh, being uh, actively researched in many groups. So today I'll take this opportunity to uh, share with you the Purdue upcycling plastic waste of polymers or fuels or monomers. I mainly focus on the fuels. So for example, the type one uh, plastic waste is a PET can be converted into monomers. 
And the type two, type four, type five, this is the polyolefins. Uh, this can be converted into fuels. And we can also uh, convert this uh, polyolefins uh, into pristine uh, polymers and re remade into polymers and then plastic products. So there are mainly two techniques. One is called select, uh, selective sequential extraction absorption. And the second method is hydrothermal processing. So uh, for the polyolefin waste, we can convert them directly into a mixture of gasoline and, and diesel fuels. And by simple dis uh, distillation separation, we can separate them into high quality gasoline and high quality diesel. So the first method is uh, the sequential selective extraction absorption methods. And uh, this works well for sorted uh, waste, as I said. So you have plastic waste uh, reduced in size and uh, mixed with a, a solvent or solvent mixture at, at relatively moderate temperature and one atmospheric pressure, we can dissolve the selectively dissolve the polymers and uh, remove the additives or dyes, colors, and additives, and uh, then re-precipitate the, the, uh, the polymers into a, a, a pure polymer. And the solvent can be uh, uh, recycled through distillation. Some examples are shown here. Uh, the polyethylene waste, this is the grocery bags, uh, mixed the grocery bags and that this can be cleaned up into a clean looking polyethylene polymers and your food container can go back to a uh, pristine uh, polystyrene polymer. And these are the chopped lids and uh, uh, caps of your beverage uh, bottles. And this can be also converted through this method into uh, clean uh, polymers. And uh, the polycarbonate, this is a computer housing waste uh, with different uh, blends of polymers. This can be, uh, we can recover them, uh, the polycarbonate, pure polycarbonate of this waste. And actually we can also recover other polymers from this system. This is the example, this is a computer housing, we uh, chopped up and uh, dissolved in a weak solvent, which is 50% acetone, 50% dichloromethane. And uh, the sand and the flying retardants are dissolved and filtered out. The remaining polycarbonate and ABS rubber polymer can be extracted. Uh, this can be, uh, uh, the polycarbonate can be extracted by a stronger solvent with 80% dichloromethane. And the ABS can be filtered out and uh, the dissolved uh, polycarbonate with the solvent uh, can be heated up to evaporate the solvent and uh, you can recover very high purity polycarbonate. And the most interesting thing is the, the side stream of this extraction containing the, uh, the polymer styrene, acrylonitrile, and flame retardants uh, can be separated uh, through a simulated moving bed process into pure flame retardants and uh, pure uh, polymers. And then the solvent can be recycled. And this work has, you know, has been published in three uh, papers. Uh, the, extraction part uh, to recover pure polycarbonate, very high yield was uh, published in um, the environmental science and technology. And uh, the, the side streams containing uh, sp uh, styrene acrylonitrile and flame retardants uh, can be separated using size exclusion simulated moving bed process into a pure polymer and pure uh, mixtures of these two flame retardants, very high purity and high yield. And the costs are pretty reasonable, about 30 cents per kilogram. And uh, this uh, polycarbonate, the $1.5 of a kilogram cost, uh, includes about 90 cents uh, uh, per kilogram feedstock cost because the feedstock cost is pretty high at this point. So uh, this, uh, this process, this uh, simulated moving bed process was the first one to recover the flame retardants from this uh, uh, waste. And this was published in two papers in Journal of Chromatography. If you're interested, you can take a look. The second method is called hydrothermal processing. You, you take plastic waste that reduce in size and you can process this with a subcritical water or supercritical water at the temperature 
about 300 to 500 degrees Celsius and uh, at, at the moderate pressure, you can convert most of these uh, polymer waste, almost 90% into oil. And this oil can be further separated into gasoline and diesel fuels. We produce about 10% gas and, and which can be used for energy. And uh, the added, solid additives cannot convert in this process will be recovered and uh, separated from water and the water can be cleaned up and reused. So for example, this is a polyethylene waste and these are your plastic bags in the grocery stores, your milk jugs and some of the food containers, the pill bottle containers. And this can be pelletized and this is a type two or type four, high density or low density polyethylene. And this linear polymers uh, will first reduce into a shorter uh, oligomers and then the oligomers will further reduce into monomers. And this, uh, this monomers uh, can be uh, separated using distillation, uh, become fuels. At the lower temperature and shorter time, this, uh, this polyethylene can become very uh, good quality wax. And uh, so the conversion pathways in this HTP process uh, are well understood. So as I said, the polymers reduce in the, into shorter chains, uh, wax-like uh, hydrocarbons, and this will further reduce in size into olefins uh, with double bonds or uh, paraffins without double bonds. And the olefins can be converted in this process into cycloparaffins, alkylbenzenes, and eventually, if you process too long, they will become multi-ring aromatics. And the small amount of gas will be generated from the olefins and also from the, the paraffins. So the composition of the polyethylene oils uh, can be controlled uh, within this process. Uh, in this diagram, we see the carbon number distribution uh, from C4 to uh, C31. And uh, the compositions of different types of chemicals are shown here, the normal paraffins, cycloparaffins, aromatics, and isoparaffins. And you can see that the, the standard, the polymer standards, uh, this uh, carbon number distribution and the composition uh, really very similar uh, to the, you, you get from the mixtures of the low density, high density grocery bags uh, from the grocery stores and the, in this IRIMA pallets. If you take a milk jug, you can also get a similar carbon number distribution and uh, the types of compounds uh, in this oil. And the grocery bags uh, processed separately can also uh, get the similar oil. So this oil can be uh, separated using distillation uh, into gasoline or or diesel, pro, uh, diesel products. And uh, if the system is not optimized, you may produce some heavy oil in this process. But the, using the two-dimensional uh, GC uh, analysis, you see that the compositions of the HTP diesel from this waste is cleaner uh, than the commercial diesel uh, you, 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 under this uh, same uh, analysis. So we can also convert uh, this, uh, as I said, into a mixture. If you optimize the conditions, you can uh, get a mixture and you can separate it in a very simple distillation uh, step into gasoline and diesel. So uh, this HTP gasoline, the carbon number distribution, the composition are compared with those of commercial gasoline. You can see that they have similar carbon number distribution and very similar compositions. And the HTP diesel from the polyethylene waste also is very similar to that of commercial diesel. So we have checked the quality of the diesel fuels produced from the polyethylene waste and shown here. So by stars, and you can see that uh, there are many uh, different checkpoints or certification uh, criteria uh, for to qualify this as ultra low sulfur number one diesel. And uh, so, you know, all the properties uh, shown here, the C10 number, flashpoint, viscosity, cloud point, temperature for 90% evaporation, sulfur, water, sediments, uh, aromatic content, they're all within the uh, uh, 
required qualities of the diesel fuels. Similarly, you can take polypropylene waste, and these are your food containers and, the, and the, your lids or caps of your uh, beverage particle, uh, beverage bottles. You can reduce them into chunks, uh, size millimeter uh, size uh, chunks, and then this will be converting in this HTP process because polypropylene has some uh, branches, uh, so you can produce branched uh, paraffins uh, or olefins, and then this will further reduce in size into monomers. And this, at this stage, you can separate them into uh, almost with 100% yield into two products, clean gasoline or clean diesel. So this pathway for this uh, conversion of polypropylene are also well understood is uh, from the uh, long chain polymer to a short chain uh, wax like uh, polymer and then this will convert into olefins these are unsaturated aliphatics or saturated aliphatics and this will further convert into cyclics aromatics and this mono gas was produced so the pp gasoline and diesel are shown here uh, the gasoline produced the PP waste, uh, similar to the commercial gasoline, and uh, the diesel uh, product produced from the polypropylene waste, also very similar to the commercial diesel. So the quality of the gasoline from the PP waste uh, are also met all the requirements uh, for the gasoline uh, properties required. For example, the anti-knocking uh, index, which is related to octane number, uh, is, is acceptable, actually pretty high. Uh, all the other properties, viscosity, et cetera, they're all within the acceptable limit in the green region uh, of this uh, chart. And they compare very favorably with the ExxonMobil gasoline or BP gasoline. So the diesel uh, product getting from the polypropylene also satisfy all the uh, diesel uh, qualification uh, requirements. Uh, for example, this the C10 number is that this is a little bit low on this uh, on this uh, uh, process, but uh, the, all the other rest of the properties uh, met the requirements of diesel fuels. So if you compare converting the polyolefin waste to fuels with other options, uh, you can look at the energy consumption in megajoules per kilogram. And uh, the, this hydrothermal processing energy requirement is similar to that of pyrolysis to oil. Um, and the, the, but it's still favorable uh, compared to producing the fuels from crude oil because you don't have the mining and transportation energies uh, consumed. And uh, the extraction and absorption methods converting the polyolefin into pristine polymers is also um, favorable. And uh, the, basically, the, this energy consumption is due to recycling of the solvent by distillation. But this energy, you can see that is still much uh, lower than the energy required to synthesize polyolefin. Or, or even lower than the mechanical uh, recycling. So the greenhouse gas emission in terms of CO2 per, per ton produced, the hydrothermal process also compares very favorably compared to, to all the other processes. The polyolefin synthesis uh, is, is, is the worst. It has a lot of uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission. Uh, so the, this is much better than the option by incineration. And in terms of potential profit estimated, the HTP uh, is estimated to have slightly higher profit than the pyrolysis uh, to produce oil because uh, the, the products are simple mixtures of gasoline and, and diesel mixtures. And by one simple distillation step, we can separate the two products so we don't need any upgrading or further processing requirements. So that's why it has a, a little more profit than uh, pyrolysis oil and then send to the oil to the refineries for further processing and upgrading. And this is uh, supposed to be estimated to be more profitable than producing the crude oil, uh, producing crude oil and then refine, 
the crude oil into fuels. However, the most profitable uh, method is really if you have sorted polymers and you can uh, get the and convert them into pristine polymers using the solvent extraction absorption method is still the most profitable. And this is almost as profitable or more than uh, synthesizing polyolefins uh, from, the, from monomers. And this is uh, expected to be more profitable than mechanical recycling, but much more profitable than incineration. So if in the future uh, there are plastic, sorted plastic waste available at the lower cost, this is the current cost, which is pretty high, the feed co feedstock cost, especially for type 1 PET. Uh, so uh, if in the future these costs are uh, further reduced and this analysis will become even more favorable for the solvent extraction process. So of course, you know, if you have sorted uh, polymers, it doesn't make sense to incinerate uh, the expensive uh, feedstock into, uh, uh, into a, you know, carbon dioxide. Uh, so the profit from pyrolysis is also, uh, it doesn't, doesn't make sense for the type one PET because the high feedstock cost, because they usually mechanically recycled. So, uh, but the, the pyrolysis is supposed to have some profit for, especially for uh, the mixed films and uh, or the, the mixed uh, waste. And the profit from HTP, uh, if you use HTP convert a PET into monomers, it should have a decent profit according to our preliminary estimate. And uh, the, uh, the profit from uh, HTP for, uh, to convert uh, this sorted plastic waste into uh, fuels, are the profits are relatively low. But if you have mixed films, which has much lower feedstock cost, and then the profit is, is reasonable. And this, this method also is promising for, um, uh, for mixed waste. So the above uh, profit analysis really does not consider uh, the additional benefits for converting the plastic waste. So we can save materials uh, by converting them into useful products. And we can save about 220 million tons of materials instead of going to landfills, they are going to be used for products. And we can save about 2 billion uh, barrels of crude oil per year you know, by, by converting them into fuels. And this also does not consider the cleaning cost uh, in the future for the environment or restoring the ecosystem or uh, improving the health, uh, reducing uh, the healthcare costs. So in summary, the potential impacts, uh, the technologies have potential to convert between 60 to 80% of the plastic waste into use for products. And this means uh, $200 billion worth of pristine polyolefins or $100 billion of gasoline and diesel fuels. And for the PET, that means about $14 billion uh, of monomers. So in this process, we can reduce the CO2 emission by one to six tons of plastic waste and per, you know, per ton of plastic waste converted. We can reduce the crude oil consumption needed for for fuels or for uh, making pristine polymers. And the, we can achieve circular use of materials. It's more efficient, and less wasteful. And we can most importantly reduce the risk of plastic pollution on the environment and potential on the human health. So the third question I ask, can we save the planet in time? I don't know the answer, uh, but I think you can help. So by replace plastic products uh, with natural products, by reduce the usage, by recycle, and especially we need very badly to increase the collection rate from the current uh, 14 or 10% to greater than 80% uh, to catch up with the, the increase the use of the plastic uh, products. So do not mix plastics with trash because once it goes into landfills, it's very expensive to retrieve. And remember that clean sorted plastic waste, you know, can, we can process them into useful products with the least um, 
processing costs were always the highest profits. And we badly need uh, public policies uh, globally. You know, we need a new Paris Agreement. So we must have policies, laws, incentives for reducing plastic waste as a group. And uh, perhaps higher tipping fees or taxes for landfills or incineration will help uh, to solve this problem. And we need uh, significant improvements in the infrastructures for waste collection and processing. So I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of the team, my uh, collaborator, Dr. Kilas, and uh, the two formal postdocs who work on this project, Dr. Chen, who is a, right now a, a faculty member at UMass Law, and Dr. Vasca, who is a faculty member in the California State University, Los Angeles. Especially my current graduate student, Kai Jin, uh, Clayton Gentercore, and my collaborator, Dr. Xiao, who is a senior uh, engineer in chemical engineering. And uh, I also uh, acknowledge the enthusiastic support of Dr. Uh, Lynn Daman, who is the managing director for the Center of the Environment at Purdue. So there are some uh, patent uh, and uh, publications uh, that are available if you're interested. And I thank you for your attention. I would love to answer any questions or any further discussion. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions. You can use the, the chat function or the raise hand function. Um, Sabash, go ahead. Yeah, Professor Wang, uh, this yes. is Subhash Shinde. Uh, a very, very interesting talk and uh, you have painted a, I would say a comprehensive picture of what we should be doing. Um, so I, I mean, I completely agree with you on, on the line of attack for what we already have produced and maybe producing in near future. What are your thoughts about um, creating a class of degradable plastics um, that will, I would say, address this issue uh, right going into the process? Um, Yes, uh, thank you for your question. I really appreciate this. Uh, the bio, you're talking about biodegradable or chemically degradable plastics, is that right? Yes. Yeah, putting so, in some weak points in the, yeah. Right, so uh, this is an active area of research. Uh, the question you need to ask is what they're degrading into, right? So you have additives, dyes, and all this other antioxidants and all this stuff. Uh, when you degrade them uh, naturally in the landfill, for example, uh, I'm not sure uh, this will improve the situation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the uh, so that's that's one concern: the the biodegradable uh, plastics, uh, and also in the natural environment, they degrade differently, right? It's buried deep in the landfill or is exposed on the surface and different climates, uh, different temperatures, humidities, and mm. all that, they degrade uh, very differently. It's unpredictable. And uh, these plastics can last for, you know, for decades or, or, or centuries, actually, if you leave them in the landfills. So they're great, degrading slowly, slowly. And uh, so the biologists just began to study uh, what are the impacts uh, you know, on living organisms. You know, <laughs> they're starting with very simple organisms at this yeah. time. I think it will take them a decade to understand what's the impact on human health. So in the meantime, maybe we're running out of time. Uh, that's what my concern is. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, so the, Biodegradation is uh, is I think is a two way sword. Uh, so so I you know I'm not working on that area. Uh, maybe you can invite some other uh, speakers uh, next time uh, <laughs> look, uh, to upgrade, to look into this update about uh, uh, oh, yeah. the fast moving field as well. Yes. No, I yeah. A quick quick comment is uh, no no. Uh, that's not what uh, what I'm. I mean, you have now tremendous experience. So based on that, uh, would you also be able to contribute to setting a strategy for creating a line of plastics 
that could be best positioned for recycling effectively. So, you know, just develop a comprehensive strategy. And I think yeah. your knowledge is very, very relevant uh, for yeah. that kind of strategy de development. Right, so, yeah. actually, yeah. if they are sorted, they can be easily converted. Okay, that key is the, the problem mix. You know, once you mix into a horrible mixture, then the, your options are very limited. So uh, even with the existing polymers, without uh, further uh, modification on the chemical structures, for example, the polyolefins can be, you know, rest restored into uh, pristine polymers and, and purified and reused again into a circular loop. Uh, so uh, so the, the question is uh, the mixing, you know, to, you know, there's a cost of the okay. mixing. And uh, right now, uh, first of all, uh, the collection rate is dropping from 14% to less than 10% uh, yeah. since the yeah. China closed the door <laughs> yes. uh, to, to import our plastic waste. You know, uh, the, the, sh the, sh the ships from China to the West Coast, uh, full of goods, you know, unloaded in the West Coast on the way back to China, they usually, they, used to load this with plastic waste and other waste and back to China. But China can no longer process uh, this waste. So they closed the door in 2018, 2019. Yep, yep. Since then this problem is getting even worse because the collected waste has nowhere to go. So they're eventually landfilled. So the situation is getting worse every day. And uh, so the, you know, so the, you know, I, you know, the, the problem is the consumer, I think, is part of the problem because uh, uh, we are so used to the single use disposal, disposal, you know, single use culture. So for the convenience, uh, so they're all mostly went to the trash. So that's an, uh, the first problem. Uh, the second problem is there is infrastructure for collection uh, is not there. Uh, so they are collecting it as a mixture. So this processing cost is higher as you demix uh, the mixture, and uh, the the business has no no incentive if there is no profit. <laughs> so there are multiple uh, questions, barriers. multiple yeah. barriers, yeah. and yeah. Uh, so I think if we have a common goal to have agreement that we have to solve this problem, and to have like in Europe, you know, they have a goal of zero plastics into landfills by 2030. Uh, so this kind of goals will help the situation. Without those, I think, you know, it's for business as usual. I think the situation can only get worse. So uh, in the meantime, I think with COVID, with the increase the use of the polypropylene in your mask and yes. all this disposable yes. garment, so this situation is getting even worse. So, uh, so this is a very serious problem. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have good news to. to oh no, it's share. important. Yeah, it's important <laughs> to think think about it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'll take just a couple more quick questions. Um, yeah. I'll ask the first one. You showed the properties of gasoline and diesel that were produced by the polyolefins uh, hydrothermal process. Have yeah. you looked at the, have you looked um, to see if these could be possibly used as lubricants? Yes, yes. The, you know, it's a matter of controlling the conversion conditions. You know, this will have temperature, pressure, the ratio of the plastic to water ratio, etc. So if you convert, control those temperature, pressure and time, the conversion time, we can produce lubricants as well. Because that, that's why the beauty of understanding the pathway. So you can uh, control the conversion conditions to produce a, a wide range of products. I didn't have time to show you the kinetic models, you know, to allow us to optimize the conditions to produce the products uh, that uh, one desires. So it's very flexible uh, method. Uh, so, uh, so it's a matter of tuning uh, the conditions. And this is much more tunable than pyrolysis, for example. All right. And there's two more questions. The first yes. one will go to Joseph. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Prof, for the good presentation you, uh, at least to save our environment. Um, my question is, uh, your, one of the, your method of uh, converting the plastic waste to uh, foil and uh, monomers. Yes. Uh, if, if the monomers are further compounded 
to polymers. Yes. Uh, have you looked at a way of possibilities of those polymers becoming uh, eco-friendly? Uh, <laughs> thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, depending on uh, what you define eco-friendly, uh, in my view, um, the, the most of the polymers with the, especially with the additives, you know, with dyes, with uh, flame retardants, uh, with uh, antioxidants, with all this, as they degrade in the landfill, they cannot be eco-friendly. Uh, so the, 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 of course, you know, there are, once you produce into monomers, uh, there you can make into other products other than plastic waste. Uh, so your question is uh, whether uh, these, uh, the polymers can be made into eco-friendly. I, I think with no, existing no, no, composition no. is very difficult. No, no, that is not what I really mean. I'm sorry. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the products that comes from uh, the, your plastic, uh, plastic weights, you said the product could be foil or monomers. Is that... I mean, one of the strategies, I, converting plastic waste to foil and uh, monomers. Yes, yes. Uh, what I mean yeah. is the type one. This is a PET. Let me see what I have. Uh, yeah. PET. So my question uh, on that yeah. is, my question on that is, those the monomers that come from the that uh, strategy, if the monomers are converted to uh, or compounded to polymer. What is uh, the eco-friendliness of the uh, the product that comes from that? Yes, it will be the same. See, you decompose, for example, the water bottle uh, into uh, into the the pure uh, monomers, and then uh, you can resynthesize it to a polymers again to make a water bottle again. So, uh, so the the Hydrothermal processing just convert uh, this polymer into the individual original monomers. After purification, they become pure monomers. So you can redo uh, the, the polymers again. It will be the same polymer. So uh, th they're not going to be more eco-friendly or less eco-friendly than the, the, the other, the original, yeah, okay. the synthesis of virgin polymers. I hope that that clarifies. All right, and yeah, our final question will go to Humberto. Yes. Yes, hello, Professor. Thank yeah. you very much, very interesting. Thank you. Um, your samples show pre-processed plastic, uh, shredded, clean, and it seems that it's just one type of polymer per sample or processed at a time. Have uh, you done testing with mixed plastic waste, not pre-processed? And if uh, so, have you, have you gotten the same results? Right, right. No, the, yes, you can get the same results, but you need more steps. That's the problem. You increase the processing cost. As, as, as your mixture become more complex, you need more steps. Then the processing cost will increase because you need more solvent and you need to recycle more solvent. So this cost will increase with the complexity of your, your plastic waste mixture. So that's why I'm saying that, uh, yes, you can, uh, we have tried uh, binary uh, polymers and tertiary polymers. You can restore them into pristine polymers. The problem is cost and there is nobody can make a profit if the cost is too high. Uh, so that's why I'm saying, uh, so, uh, so, you know, there's a cost of the mixing. Uh, so, and the, to restore them into uh, pure products again. So that's the inherent uh, nature of the problem. So uh, that's why I think if consumer or can help uh, clean the, the, the end of life products and help collect clean sorted plastic waste, and then, the, then we can easily convert them back into polymers reuse. Uh, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Professor Wong. Thank you. All right, so I will ask our 